Welcome to Inspirational Journeys, everyone. My name is Ann Harrison, and this week my special guest is Scott LaPierre. He's an author, a pastor, and a speaker. So welcome to the show, Scott. Thanks, Ann. Glad to be here and have this time with you and your listeners. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and um, so first, start by introducing yourself to the listeners, because nobody can tell you. Okay, sure. So I'm a pastor in Southwest Washington. We have been here since 2010. My wife and I grew up together in Northern California, and we came to Washington for the uh, pastorate at Woodland Christian Church. Figure we'll probably spend our lives here. Um, I started writing books largely drawn from my sermons about five or six years ago. I write out my sermons very thoroughly. Some pastors have more abbreviated notes, but I pretty much have a manuscript and so it translates well into um, books or sometimes, you know, even chat a sermon could, could make a nice chapter for a book. Mm. There's still some work to be done, but it, it's a nice system that you're laboring all this time on a sermon. And then you can get more mileage out of it by turning it into a book, which is an approach many pastors take. And uh, we have nine children, uh, which can be a surprise to people. So maybe just briefly to explain that, you know, we didn't, it wasn't like we got married and set out to just, you know, try to have a ton of kids or something. It was more like we got married and we had the conviction to just let God give us what he wanted to give us, not really a commentary on what other people uh, should do. That was just our conviction. My, uh, my wife turned 40 this year, so maybe that maybe we won't have any more. Our, our ninth child was born in September, or maybe God will bless us with some more. I do some speaking. My elders graciously give me about, you know, eight uh, weekends per year to go speak, generally at conferences. Uh, I put on marriage conferences most often, but speak at homeschool conferences too. And so we'd stay pretty busy with between pastoring and writing and speaking and being a father and husband. That's pretty much what consumes all my time. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Sounds like you're pretty busy. So what inspired you to start writing the book on marriage? So, well, basically my mom, my wife did. She had been telling me for years that I was putting so much time and effort into my sermons, and then you kind of go up to the pulpit and preach it and come down, and then you're pretty much done with that sermon because you're not going to preach the same sermon again. So I had all this material from, you know, literally thousands of hours of studying God's word, and, and each week I'm working on this sermon, polishing it and refining it uh, as I pour over it, and I want to be extemporaneous, so even though I work on the manuscript, I'm familiar enough with it that when I get up to preach, I don't have to read it. And Katie would frequently tell me, you put so much time into your sermons, you ought to write a book. And the problem is I was so busy that I kept putting that off. And then I preached this series on marriage at my church. And it was kind of a, a running joke that it was supposed to be the marriage month and it became the marriage year because, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because the congregation, you kind of feel out your congregation and they seem to be enjoying the sermons on marriage. And I was enjoying the studying and preaching and it just kind of kept going. And then I finished with all these sermons on marriage and or all this material. And Katie said, you know, this is what you ought to do. Your first book on is marriage from these sermons. And I had no idea what I was doing. I never aspired to be a writer. I wanted to, I didn't particularly like writing when I was growing up. And I, we just took some vacation two weeks of vacation and went to my in-laws, my wife's parents' house in Northern California, where Katie and I grew up together and started trying to put all these sermons together in a, in a book, not having any idea really how difficult it was going to be and how much work was really involved in publishing a book and, and marketing it and so forth, which you would, you'd be familiar with. Yeah. Um, honestly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so, um, I love how you use real world examples, not only from the Bible, but from your life and those that, that, that you've come in contact with to illustrate the points. And it's funny because when I started reading the book, the four, about the four words in Greek for, for love, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of interesting because our pastor, my, my pastor, pastor at my church was preaching about that on Sunday. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of interesting. I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah, it, it's one of the weaknesses of the English language that yeah. we don't think about. We're so familiar with certain things that we don't consider kind of the oddness at times. Um, the fact that I would say that I love my wife, I love popcorn, you know, I love my children, I love wrestling, and use the same word for love in each of those relationships, if you want to actually say it's a relationship with popcorn or chocolate or something. But anyway, we, we say that we love chocolate or love football with the same word. We say we love our, our spouse or our parents. 
And we obviously have different, even with people, we have, I have a different love for my parents than I have for my wife that I have for my children. And, but we still use the same word, but the Greek language recognizing these different relationships has multiple words. So that, that word for love that you would have for a family member is, or a familiar love, familial love is storge. And the word for friendly love that you would have with your neighbor or a good friend would be uh, phileo. And many people know that just from Philadelphia, the city of brotherly mm-hmm. love. So phileo is brotherly love. And with that, that word is used in uh, the New Testament. The word storge is not, but the word astorgos, so you put an A in front of it, which makes it the opposite. And there's a, there's a verse where it says that, that people, when the word, you know, um, as the world gets worse, people are going to lack love. And it's, it's storge or astorgos, it's lacking familial love. It would be the love that's supposed to be between, let's say, a mother and a child. And so for mm. women to be comfortable uh, having abortions or murdering their children, that's the epitome of the absence of storge or the epitome of astorgos. And then there's eros, which is the uh, a physical attraction or sexual attraction. It's related to our word erotic. And then probably the most familiar word for love is agape, which is that sacrificial, unconditional love that Christ has. It's the same word in John three sixteen, where it says that for God so okay. loved agape the world, the world yep. or, or Ephesians 5, 25, husbands love your wives agape as Christ loved agape, the church. And there's really only two relationships in scripture that contain the word agape. It's God's love for us or Christ's love for us. And then a few verses later, everyone's familiar with John 3, 16, John 3, 19 says men love darkness rather than light. And men have an unconditional sacrificial agape love for sin. If you understand what agape means, it makes perfect sense. If you think of man's relationship to sin, man loves sin unconditionally or sacrificially. In other words, man will sacrifice for sin. There are a few things that man will not sacrifice for the sins that he wants to commit. And then man has an unconditional love for sin in that man will love sin even if it's not reciprocated or sin does nothing in return. In fact, we suffer as a result of our sin. And so it's perfectly fitting to say that we have the men love darkness or have an agape for darkness and sin. Mm, Wow. Yeah. And so I liked how in in the book, I know when you talked about men being the head of the household and men taking on leadership roles in the church, Mm -hmm. you kind of brought to mind a question, but I'm glad you, as I read further, you answered it. And I'm thinking, well, can women not be leaders like in business or something? But then you answered that, yeah, women can be leaders, but it's it's a different, you know, because there are certain there's certain ta- certain things, certain skills that women have that men don't. Mm-hmm. So if I kind of elaborate on that and I'll get a little yeah. momentum into this, there are generally two views of the genders. This might be an oversimplification, but I still think it it illustrates the point. Um, one view would be what's called uh, complementarian, which is what I am. Complementarian, not C-O-M-P-L-I, like you compliment or praise someone, but C-O-M-P-L-E, complement or fit together. And the idea is men and women are equal, but they have different roles and responsibilities, and they complement each other or fit together well. And we see that biblically because God has different instruction for men versus women or husbands versus wives. We don't look in scripture. There are some things that are said to both genders, like everyone should forgive, everyone should be prayerful, everyone should love others. But then there are specific commands or instruction for husbands that are different than the instruction for wives or verse, or for example, I just mentioned Ephesians 5.25. That is said to husbands, but it is not said to wives. There's different instruction for wives about Ephesians 5.22 commands wives to submit to their husbands. And then verse 33 Ephesians 5.33 commands wives to respect their husbands. Colossians, and then like Colossians 3, it says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. But there's no corresponding verse telling wives not to be harsh with their husbands. And it's not to say that a woman can't be harsh, but there's a verse commanding husbands not to be harsh with their wives because men have a greater propensity toward harshness than women do. Similarly, in Proverbs there are many verses about wives, not about women, not nagging their husbands. It says that it can cause a man to want to go sit on the corner of a rooftop or dwell out in the you know wilderness. And kind of the idea is 
a man would rather be exposed to terrible weather on a roof rooftop or or be out in the wilderness with with um, wild animals versus having to be in the house with a contentious woman well there's no corresponding proverbs warning men about nagging and so it's not to say that men can't nag but it's simply to say that women have a greater propensity toward it and so there are verses for them that are not also for for husbands and so we see these different verses for men and women, which shows that God has different <clears throat> expectations for the genders. And Ephesians 6, it commands fathers not to exasperate their children. As a father of nine, I know my potential to exasperate my children. Katie regularly tells me, hey, you're exasperating them. You're going on and on. You need to stop earlier than that. And again, it's not to say a mother wouldn't exasperate her children at times, but it is to say that a father would have a, a worse temptation toward that or propensity toward it. And so that's why I'm a pretty strong complementarian. I think it's abundantly clear in scripture that God says different things to men and women. The alternative to a complementarian view is what's known as egalitarian. And egalitarians do not believe that God has different roles and responsibilities for men and women. And these would be church, uh, egalitarian churches would be churches that have female pastors or Egalitarian marriages would be marriages where a husband is not expected to be the head of the relationship or he's not expected to be a spiritual leader. We, we look at Titus 2, and it tells older women to teach younger women to take care of their home, love their children, love their husbands. Um, and so we don't see the same thing for husbands being told to take care of their home. And, and so there are just these different um, descriptions for men and women as we carry out our service to the, to the Lord. Now, with that said, you mentioned, um, like, let's say women working. In Proverbs 31, it descri describes a woman who goes and looks at a field or purchases, purchases property for her home. Um, and it's more of a kind of a spirit of the law. It's not to say that a woman can't, can't work outside the home, but her home must maintain priority for her. There should never be something that threatens her commitment to her home and her family and her children. Whereas men who don't take care of their families are said to be worse than unbelievers. So it actually says if a man doesn't work to provide for his family, he's worse than an unbeliever is what Paul told Timothy. And you kind of think about that and it's like, well, what, what is worse than an unbeliever? I didn't even think something could be worse than mm. an unbeliever, but that's what Paul says to men that won't, won't provide. And so we just see these, these strong distinctions. And one reason I, I spent a little more time talking about this is it's so important to me because of the decline we see, not just in the world, but in the church. When God created man and woman in Genesis uh, 1, and then again in Genesis 5, it says he created them male and female, male and female, he created them. So there's these clear distinctions between men and women, but our world has started blurring that yes. line. Yes, oh yes started blurring that line between men and women first it was first there was egalitarianism which basically says men and women are identical regarding their roles and responsibilities as i just talked about but then the lines were blurred even more where a man could marry a man a woman can marry a woman or first it was a man could have a relationship with a man and now we've actually legalized homosexual marriage so it used to be that if a man had a relationship with a man it wasn't recognized as marriage but now we've legalized marriage. And now the line has become so blurred that that's actually kind of an understatement. It's not even blurred. It's actually removed because now a man can become a woman or a woman can become a man, or at least in the world's eyes. In God's eyes, a man that has created a man is always a man. He cannot yep. become a woman. No matter what he does outwardly or physically, he still remains a man to God, regardless of what physical changes he has done to his body. And the same for a woman who would say that she has become a man. But my point is, transgenderism is, shows that we finally reached the point where the line between the genders is completely removed now. And it's, it's, it's wicked. I mean, in God's eyes, I can't imagine what he thinks when he looks down and sees the sort of um, abominations that we're committing, which is really what it was, what it is when a man says that he is a woman or a woman says that she is a man. And we're doing it with our children. I mean, children need direction. They need to be pointed towards certain things and away from other things. So for example, just this morning, my son was doing something. Uh, I can't remember what it was. And it wasn't even, it wasn't a big deal, but I told him, I said, I said, Hey buddy, you don't really want to do that. That's kind of feminine. And he didn't think much about it now. And, and so he knows he's not supposed to, to do that. So we just kind of point our children, you point our boys toward masculinity, you point your girls toward femininity. Well, what we're seeing in some 
some families is we're seeing children who don't know better, who are still trying to understand life and trying to understand um, uh, growing up. And they have a question or they, they, a, a boy puts on something, you know, that's pink and all it would take would be loving parents just saying, Hey buddy, you know, that, that looks kind of feminine. It would be more appropriate if you were this or pointing their daughters toward femininity and away from masculinity. But instead we have parents that are encouraging boys to act like girls or encouraging girls to act like boys. And then they grow up without pursuing boys growing up, not pursuing masculinity, but in, in, uh, pursuing femininity. And then the parents turn around and say, oh, well, my, my son has always wanted to be a girl. When the truth is, if the parents had just provided a little bit of instruction, the child would have an entirely different mindset. And so it's definitely not legitimate to say that my son has always wanted to be a girl. It'd be more legitimate to say, I was raising my son. And instead of pointing him in the right direction, I fanned the flame toward this sinful uh, situation. And now I'm claiming that he actually wants this, which I don't think would be the case. It, it amounts, it's tantamount to child abuse, basically. Yeah. And sometimes the school systems even let, let the kids get away with that stuff. Yeah. They let either, they let it, let them get away with it, or they even encourage it. They teach yeah. curriculum, you know, we homeschool, which is not to say that again, is not a commentary on what everyone else does, but one of our big concerns was if our children were in public school, we know that not only will these things be tolerated, but they will be encouraged. There's curriculum that promotes this sort of um, behavior, tolerance of, of it, of sin. We never want to teach our children to tolerate sin. We can teach them to be loving and to be kind and responsible individuals, but we don't want to teach them that sin is okay or acceptable. So, Right. So... On the writing front, because my, um, a lot of my audience is writers, tell me about the process behind this book. I know you had the sermons, but did you outline it or did you just put them together and work? Very good. It? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm happy to kind of talk about that process. So I had all these sermons, and as you can kind of guess, what a sermon generally makes kind of like if you're preaching, I don't want to say if you're if you're a good preacher, for lack of a better way to say it, but let's say you you I think generally good preachers have a main point, a nail that's driven home through that sermon, and then a number of sub points that are related to that main point. You don't really want to have a sermon where it's all over the place and you have five to 10 unrelated points and nobody knows what you're talking about. So <clears throat> you already have a sermon that's making a main point, and then it has these sub points to it, hopefully. So I left with all these sermons that made all these points that it, it didn't work this perfectly, but but allowed many sermons to become chapters or kind of close to that. There was an amount of arranging in the material that still had to take place. But we went to my, my in-laws, as I kind of shared earlier, took these sermons, put them in a manuscript, tried to arrange the material in a, in a reasonable way. Um, and what was interesting was I had no idea an appropriate length for a book. I didn't know if 30,000 words or 80,000 words or 200,000 words. I didn't know what was what was a reasonable number. So I had a manuscript that was 120,000 words. Now for your listeners, <clears throat> to give them an idea, a typical book of let's say 250 pages is gonna be about 65 or 70,000 words. So I basically had a manuscript that was almost twice as long as it should have been. And so I had to start cutting parts of this manuscript out to make it a reasonable length because nobody wants to read a 600 page marriage book. No, and it was, no. ex it was, you know, it was pretty painful to have to take out these parts of this manuscript that you've labored over and that are very dear to you, but it's called tight writing. It's important mm -hmm. to, you know, not be repetitive to, um, you know, for any of your listeners, when you speak, you can be repetitive. In fact, generally good speakers do rep repeat points with different words or phrases to drive points home, but people don't want to read the same thing in a book. And so when you write, at least if it's uh, regarding nonfiction, you're not going to repeat yourself because people don't want to be reading and say, hey, I remember when I already read this two or three chapters ago. Instead, they can go back and they can read that. They can go back two or three chapters and read it again. So I had to tighten this up. I had to, I had to really rip, you know, cut out different parts. I had to take stories that were, you know, too long and make them half as long. And you're basically what you want is it's almost like being considerate of people's time. If you can make a point with half as many words, then make the point with half as many words. 
And so we get the manuscript down to reasonable length and then <clears throat> went the process of trying to get it published, which I had absolutely no um, familiarity with at that point in my life. So then began the new, the new journey of learning the publishing world and what it, what it is involved in that. Well, wow, yeah, I was about to say, when you, you talked about having a 600 page book on marriage, it's not, you're not writing an epic fantasy there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah that, 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 that happens in epic fantasy. I can, I can tell you that, but, and even in fiction, you don't want to be redundant either. So, mm -hmm. because people get tired of reading the same, you know, they don't like repetitive text and that's something I find hard to do. So do you have any tips or advice that you want to leave the listeners and viewers with? Regarding what in particular? Regarding, regarding marriage, marriage or regarding writing regarding or publishing? Writing, um, just, you can take it, you can, you can do, uh, if you have tips on marriage and then tips on okay. writing. Okay, sure. I, I'll talk about marriage first, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. Uh, so regarding marriage, I'm generally a big proponent of striving to have what I would call Christ-centered homes, which is why I much of my material or my marriage book is about having a Christ-centered relationship. And I mention that because I think many people who identify themselves as Christians or claim to have Christian homes believe that simply because they go to church on Sunday. And as a pastor, I'm thrilled for people to attend church on Sunday. But to have a Christian home or Christ-centered home or Christ-centered marriage or Christ-centered family means to have Christ at the center of your home or marriage or family beyond just Sunday morning. So that means Monday through Saturday, how is your family focused on Christ? Um, some, for many people, I mean, I, sadly, I think just making it to church on Sunday morning is, is considered a major accomplishment and they feel thrilled about the relationship with Christ, just being able to, to do that. And I personally, I mean, I don't wanna to sound too harsh, but I think that's kind of sad because our relationships with Christ um, should be evident throughout the entire week or throughout our lives, not just, just Sunday. Well, so what exactly does it look like to have a Christ-centered home or a Christ-centered marriage? Well, it looks like having, having Christ in your home throughout the week, whether through prayer, whether through the you know Christian music you listen to, the family worship that hopefully you engage in, the prayer times, whether at the beginning of the day or the end of the day. Um, not that we always are as faithful as we should be, not that we do this as well as, as I think we should all the time, but hopefully our family or Christian families are gathering around the word throughout the week at times. I know all of our lives are very busy, but to make Christ a priority means to bring the family together around the Bible. Um, so last night we had been reading the book of Philippians. We finished that. It had been quite a, quite a while in Philippians as a family, and I wanted to look at something in the Old Testament. So last night, we just started reading the book of Obadiah as a family. I think we only got through like maybe six or seven verses, and we'll pick, uh, so I think we finished at verse seven. We'll pick up at verse eight during our next family Bible study, maybe tonight, tonight or tomorrow. And to be clear, these, aren't, these are not very fancy Bible studies or anything like that. I have not preached on Ob Obadiah before. And so sometimes a man will say to me, well, you know, I don't know if I can read the Bible with my family. And my response is always, if you can read, then you can read the Bible with your family. Because the power is in God's word to go out and wash over our families and sanctify and cleanse our spouse and our children. And so it's the man's responsibility to, to gather the family together and to initiate this. And then it's generally the wife's responsibility to support that, you know, help gather the kids up. Um, be an encouragement. I will say one thing to all of your listeners who are, who are, fem who are Christian women. I wasn't aware of this. We tend to project ourselves on others. And so because I am comfortable standing up, speaking in front of people or preaching before a church or sharing God's word at a conference, I assume other men are comfortable with that. And I learned very quickly that most men are terrified to pray with their family or read the Bible with their family. They're afraid that they're not gonna know what to say. They're afraid they're not gonna be able to answer the questions they're asked. They're afraid that they're not gonna sound like their pastor at church or that guy on the radio or that speaker at that conference. And so I've just had men come and tell me, they say, hey, I was listening to what you're, you're saying at the conference, I'm convicted. I wanna be a spiritual leader. I wanna read the Bible with my family, but I am very afraid to do so. And so, I would tell the wise, your husband really needs your encouragement. He needs you 
to, uh, let me give you an example, an illustration that, uh, that might apply to some of the people listening. I was counseling this couple um, and I, want, I thought that many of the, pro- here's one other point I'll, I'll make. Our marriages are reflections of our relationships with Christ. We treat our spouse the way we do because of our relationship with Christ. It is, it is an outflowing of Christ, the way that I love Katie. Uh, you know, or I'm, I try to, or I'm supposed to love Katie as Christ loves the church. Well, because of that's the case, I generally try to see people strength. And when people have marriage problems, I generally try to see them strengthen their relationship with Christ. And I believe that as the vertical is fixed, then the horizontal will be fixed. The, as the relationship with Christ is strengthened, then the horizontal relationship between the spouses will be strengthened. So I was counseling this one couple and I told him, hey, I think it'd be really important for you guys to read the Bible together. I'm convinced that if you guys do that, then your, then your marriage will be strengthened. And I told my, told this gentleman I was counseling, I said, much of this rests on your shoulders. So you guys should be, you know, reading the Bible together. And so a few weeks, they began to read the Bible together. And then a few weeks later, he came back and he told me that it had been a nightmare. And I was really shocked because I thought it was going to improve their marriage, obviously not make it worse. And I said, well, what's, what's the problem? Why was this so, so uh, unfortunate or difficult? And he said, well, it's like, no matter what I said, my wife argued with me. She criticized me. She questioned everything. She, she disagreed with me. And it was like a constant argument. And so that's what I would tell the wives, that if, if your husband thinks that every single time he opens the Bible with you, it's going to be a debate, or you're going to question everything he says, he's not going to want to open the Bible with you. Now, I'm not saying that a wife can't ask questions. I'm not saying she can't disagree with her husband, or I'm not saying she can't, you know, make a few points or even point out when he's wrong. But I will say that she needs to make a lot more deposits than withdrawals. If you're going for every criticism, you need to have a lot of praise and appreciation for what your husband is doing, because otherwise he's going to be very discouraged and he's not going, he's going to dread family worship times. And so when I talk about families having family Bible studies, and that that the responsibility rests on the husband's shoulders, because God has called men to be the spiritual leaders, it could sound like, like I'm saying that the responsibility is entirely on the husband's shoulders. But the fact is, there's still a lot of responsibility that's on a wife's shoulders. There's a lot that a wife can do to make her husband's spiritual leadership in the home easier, make it more pleasant for him. So one of the things for us as a family is when I say, hey, it's time, you know, for family Bible study, um, I'll I'll be candid with you. It's not like my kids always want to do that. It's not like I say time for family Bible study and then all my kids cheer and celebrate and say, yeah, that that doesn't happen. (laughs) And and so um, one of the things Katie does, which is a big blessing is she helps round up the kids. She says, okay, let's go guys. You know, let's get our Bibles. Let's go sit in the living room. Last night we sang a, a couple songs as well. So she says, let's get our, get out the hymnals and to sing, sing some music too. And so I really appreciate, and sometimes if the kids moan and groan, Katie might pipe up. In fact, this happened the other day, I think it was last week. They were kind of complaining about something and, oh, I remember what it was. It wasn't family Bible study, but it was kind of close. We were going to take a long road trip and I had purchased an audio book. It was by, it's a, it's called Reasonable Faith by William Lane Craig. And I wanted to listen to it while we were driving and my kids were complaining, you know, they want to listen to Adventures and Odyssey, which is, which is fine. I like them listening to Adventures and Odyssey, but I said, Hey, I like us to listen to this book together. I think it's, it's pr- going to be good for your faith. And, and they're complaining and Katie just kind of interrupts and she just really started lecturing them, you know, about how fortunate they were to have this daddy that wants to listen to this audio book with his family. And, and it really changed kind of their attitude. And so I really appreciated the way that Katie supported me and helped, um, you know, the kids develop a good, a good view of what we were, we're doing and, and to, and to see some value in it that I don't think that they, that they saw before. And so, you know, if, um, if a husband is terrified to read the Bible and then his wife, you know, he says, Hey, let's get our Bibles and read as a family. And then his wife says, well, you know, why, why, why do we have to do that now? Is this the version of the Bible you're going to use? Why, why did you choose this chapter? You know, I don't know if what you're saying is correct. Then it's going to be a, he's probably not going to want to read the Bible with his family, but if she'll encourage him, then I think then that's really important for him. And it's really going to help him to be the spiritual leader that he should be. So that's one of the, one of the main things that I would say 
for, for families is for men to try to be spiritual leaders in the home and for wives to try to support their husbands in that. And I generally believe that if families will do that, if a man will be a spiritual leader and the family will gather around God's word, then many of the problems we see in families will have a way of kind of working themselves out. Wow. You just, you just put a lot of, t- you just basically condensed as far as what I've read in your book, you just basically condensed a lot of your principles into <laughs> that one little, yeah, that was one little, little tip session there. Um, and I, what I was going to say, and it came to my mind, um, <clears throat> encouragement is better than turning the Bible, the Bible study into a knockdown drag out fight. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah. know why that came to my mind, but that just, that just did. So as far as writing tips, do you have any writing tips for the listeners and viewers? Yeah, I think one thing I had to learn is that writing is a craft that we can improve on. And I don't consider myself, I didn't, when I started writing, I definitely did not consider myself a great writer. Again, I did not aspire to be a writer. I have become a writer by necessity. I wanted to be a pastor. When I, after I became a Christian, I wanted to share God's word with people. I loved studying it. I loved teaching it. And because of my profession, I send a lot of emails. I uh, do a lot of studying and preparing notes. And so I just, by necessity, became a writer. But I don't, I did not consider myself to be an exceptional one by any means, but I've been able to grow in my writing ability over the years just because of the amount of time that I've done it. And because if you work with editors, then they're generally going to be, if you have good editors, they're going to be talented writers themselves who are going to help you grow in the area of writing. And so one thing I would say is we kind of think people have gifts and there are gifts. Uh, Like, let's say I was talking earlier about teaching, you know, some men have the gift of teaching and some men do not. There are different gifts that the Bible discusses people having. And then there are just, some people are more musical. Some people have a gift of leadership. Some people are very empathetic or merciful. And and so there's all these different ways that we're gifted, but there's are some gifts that we can improve on with practice and use like teaching. Even if someone has a gift of teaching, generally they will acknowledge that given time and experience and opportunities, they will grow in the area of teaching. Well, it's the same with writing. Nobody just starts writing and is an exceptional writer. Instead, it's important to understand that as you write more, you will improve as a writer. And there's kind of this idea that your first book, um, you might not want to publish it. It might kind of want to be practice or you might want to keep working on it. I wish I'd have thought about that when I was a writer. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You might want to work on it for a while before you launch it out into the world. Um, By God's grace, my first book ended up, and now I kind of sound like I'm contradicting what I just said, but my first book ended up being has been my best book which was which was um, my marriage book well in a sense it wasn't my first my first writing I had already been writing as a pastor for like eight years and the first book I wrote I'd already had all that time writing sermons and so when I did my first book I had thousands of hours that I had spent writing you know and so just understand that you're going to get better at it don't be discouraged try to find a good editor and don't look to the people who love you for honest feedback. Something people no. do is they, they write something and then they show it to their mom or their spouse or their kids oh, or their yeah. best friend who, of course, what does their best friend or mom or spouse say? Oh, oh this that's is- the best thing you've ever written. Exactly. And then, pe- yeah. <laughs> and then people believe that. And then mm-hmm. they, I don't want to say they become proud, but they can become unreceptive to honest criticism that actually could help them. And so what you want is you want to find a quality editor. I would say if you're a Christian writer, then you want to find a Christian editor who can look at your work and help you grow is in this craft. And so I've been fortunate. There have been a couple editors I did not think were quality editors and I did not continue working with them. I now have two or three editors that I'm very confident in that I, that I, well, now I work with, I'm a traditionally published author. Now I don't, I'm no longer self-publishing. I signed with Harvest House and they have an editor that I work with and I trust him. But before that, when I was self-publishing, I was looking at editors and I found some very good ones who helped me really grow as a writer. They showed me some of my weaknesses. Uh, Just off the top of my head, one of my big weaknesses was introductions. I did not have very good introductions to my chapters. There was no kind of hook, I would just kind of launch right into, you know, some verses or exposition. And and there was no real introduction in my closings, my conclusions of my chapters were not good. And they did not set up the following chapter like they should. And so 
there was someone that really kind of ripped my book apart and at pretty much every single chapter and said, hey, all of your chapters, the beginning and the end need to improve. You're doing fine in the middle, the body of the chapter, but the beginning and end is really weak and you need to work on that. Well, that was discouraging and it was a lot of work to go back and fix all that, but it was a real blessing to, um, you know, produce a better manuscript as a result and to grow in that area for future, for future books. So now all my books that I write, I make sure they have a good introduction. Um, so, so that's something else I'd say. Okay. So, and what are you working on now? Good. Thanks for asking. So I signed this multi-book deal with Harvest House and my marriage book came out in September. Well, I guess that might sound confusing because I said my marriage book was my first book. I self-published a marriage book. It did well enough that that's the book that my first book that I said, did, said by God's grace did well. Well, it did well enough that Harvest House picked me up as one of their authors ah. and they signed me, they signed me to a multi-book deal. But what they wanted to do was they wanted to republish my marriage book. So my marriage book came out first self-published in 2016 and then uh, republished by Harvest House in 2021 in September. It's called Your Marriage God's Way. There's a book and a workbook. And then my finance book comes out with Harvest House in May. It's called Your Finances God's Way. And there's a book and workbook. And probably after that, I have a book on contentment that I'm entertaining publishing next from some sermons I preached on contentment. And I thought it would be a nice follow-up to my book on marriage, but the, the, the traditionally published, the traditional publishing world for any of your listeners um, is very slow compared to the self-publishing world. You can self-publish a book over a weekend, but if you want to traditionally publish, you're going to be dealing with a publisher that has to fit you into their lineup of books over the coming year or years. You, I had, a, I had my marriage book already done and they did not even want it from me for like nine months because it wasn't going to be, it was going to be so long until it was actually published. So if, a t if time is a big issue to you, then you might want to self-publish. But if, if you, and the other thing is some people, you know, want to traditionally publish and it's just very difficult. It's difficult to kind of get into that world. Um, especially if you want to get a large publisher, which is what I would, I would, if people can't get a large publisher, I would just encourage them to self-publish because otherwise they're going to be doing a lot of the work and giving a lot of the money, the proceeds to the self, to the publisher anyway. So I don't think it's a very good approach unless you can get a large publisher. Right. So where can people find you online? So my website, scottlapierre.org. Uh, do you, can you just put the link for that in the show notes? I have, yeah, I did. Okay. So if people look in the show notes, they can see the link to my website, scottlapierre.org. And there's also a, a free book or free gift I like to give away. It's called Seven Biblical Insights for Healthy, Joyful, Christ-Centered Relate Marriages. And it's basically some excerpts from my marriage book. It's a short read. You know, it's not the 250 page book or anything. And kind of my hope to be candid is that if people like this, then they'll want to go out and buy the, <laughs> you know, buy the marriage book and workbook itself. But it's a free gift that I hope can, even if people never buy my book, I hope it can strengthen their marriage and their relationship with Christ. So my website is where you can find my books and all my social media links. Um, if you want my, if you're interested in my purchasing any of my books, you can find them on my amp on Amazon, look for my, just search for me and all my books come on my Amazon author page comes up. And, and I think that'd be probably the best place. And if money's an issue, you know, if you can't afford any of my books for whatever reason, go ahead and let me know. And I'd be happy to give you a free ele electronic copy. So basically it's hard to make money with writing. I would discourage people from trying to make a living from it. You write, cause you want to get out a message that God has given you. And that's my heart's desire. And so if money's tight, let me just give you this, this book that I hope will strengthen your relationship with Christ, basically. And I noticed you have an audiobook. Did you narrate it? Uh, good question. So my first couple audiobooks, I did not narrate myself. And now I started narrating my books. I've, I've uh, obtained access to a studio and that I'm able to use. I don't have one in my home. And I'm going to be narrating my books from now on. So yeah, oh, nice. thank you for asking that. And the other thing, I guess, is I have a, I have a YouTube channel that has all of my all my sermons, my conference messages, my guest preaching. So you can also search for me, Scott Lapp, here on YouTube and find my, find the videos for my sermons there. Oh, nice. Okay. So what do you have, and I know we've talked a bunch of different verses, but do you have a, a Bible verse you want to leave the listeners and viewers with? 
Sure. Um, it's, I, I might be wrong, but I bet it's a verse that nobody's ever shared as kind of their life verse. And the reason is simply that generally when people have like a favorite verse or a life verse, it's kind of a verse that sounds really good from beginning to end. And this verse does not sound great from beginning to end. In fact, kind of the end of the verse might not even sound like it, you know, or the whole verse might not even sound like a life verse at all. But in first Samuel chapter two, verse 30, um, God says, I will honor those who honor me and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. And I just think that that verse presents a principle that if we apply to our lives, um, or can really apply to every area of our lives, God says, I will honor those who honor me. And it's a good question to ask in any decision or situation or relationship we're facing, what in this will honor God? And if we strive to honor him, then he will honor us in return. We can apply that to our marriage, to our parenting, to our homes, pretty much to everything. So... Wow. Okay. So would you like to close us out in prayer? Yeah, and I will. Thank you. Father, I thank you for Anne and her ministry and, and all that she's doing for her listeners. And thank you for um, just her joy and the peace she has, despite some of her, uh, her um, issues with seeing. It's a, it's a privilege just to be around someone that handles things, difficulties like that so well. And I pray you bless her and her ministry. And by bless, I don't, I don't mean she you know, becomes rich or anything like that. I just mean that you allow her ministry to reach people and to point them toward Christ. I thank you for this time. And I pray that if there's anything that people learned that um, it could serve them, strengthen their marriages, help, help the people who are listening to be focused on serving you with their lives and with their efforts. And if there's any ways I can serve them, that they would reach out to me uh, through my website, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So thank you so much for being on the show today. And Folks, go out and get the book. I mean, it's it's really got some valuable principles in it. So I ch we challenge you today to go out there and read to get inspired, write something inspiring, and share your creation with the world. For when you've touched one life, you've touched thousands. Thanks for joining us on Inspirational Journeys. And remember, your story matters. Have a blessed day, everyone.